Hi there, I'm Janet Lynn. And I'm Will Zeilinger. We are coming to you from Long Beach, California. We are a married couple who write together and separately. Between us, we have 15 books, and yes, we are still married. We also write under E.J. Williams for our new series, International Mysteries. Our first book, Stone Pub, will be released in 2021. As published authors, we have spoken at several venues, such as BoucherCon, Left Coast Crime, L.A. Lit Crawl, West Hollywood Book Fair, Santa Monica Public Library, American Association of University Women, Glendale Public Library. We've met so many authors over the years, and with the advent of Zoom, we thought we'd chat with authors that we know and love. Today we have Rebecca Forster with us. Rebecca started writing on a crazy dare and found her passion. Now, she's a USA Today and Amazon best-selling author of over 40 books. She's taught at the acclaimed UCLA Writers Program and is a sought-after speaker, including three appearances at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. In her spare time, spare time, she court watches and travels the world looking for inspiration for her novels. She's married to a superior court judge and is mother of, to two sons and lives in the Los Angeles area. Boy, here's Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. I, good morning. How are you? Oh, doing good. On a dare? You started writing on a dare? Tell on a me dare. About that. I, I would love to tell you about that because I, I may be the only one who didn't keep journals when I was 12. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I had never written anything um, and I was working in advertising. My client uh, ran a cruise line and, and he liked to have uh, meetings at his home in San Francisco, big mansion. Absolutely beautiful. I don't think he liked to go in the office very much. So my group and I would have to trot out to this beautiful home and sit around and have our meetings. And one evening we were having a meeting. Everybody was really tired and we all just wanted to go home. And my client's wife kept coming in and out and in and out and asking him things and doing things. And I was getting so frustrated and I turned to my, my assistant and I said, you know, who does that woman think she is? Of course I said this <laughs> under my breath and my assistant just totally deadpan says, well, that's Danielle Steele. And I'm like, I don't care. I want to go home. Who's Danielle Steele. I really <laughs> honestly had no idea who she was at all. And so what happened was once I found out who she was and what she did, I, I mistakenly, you know, said, oh, I could do that. And this same assistant said, I dare you. But she told everybody in our firm and we had two floors. We had a ton of people. So she ran around telling everybody I was going to write a book. And that was that. So to save face, I wrote a book. Well, I sort of wrote a book. I wrote part of a book and sent it to a publisher. That's amazing. <laughs> it was pretty cool, actually. But yeah. you know, at the time, I, I, I was just, didn't have my kids yet. I was pregnant with my first son when my first one was published. And so you don't, you don't really think about it. You think about, oh, this, this is fun. This is a challenge. I think a lot of people love the challenge of trying something new. And it never dawned on me anybody would pay attention to it. I mean, who, who would think that? And then they bought it. And I was like, ah, oh, what am I supposed to do now? Now, what year was this? This was 1985, 80, 84, 85, around there, that I sent it in. And remember, those were the old days when you actually typed it on a typewriter. You made Xeroxes. You sent it, you know, via snail mail, and you waited. And so um, I had, because my my business background is marketing. I had just sort of researched what it took to get someone's attention, hoping that I would get a rejection and my assistant would stop with all the ribbing. <laughs> um, so 
I found out that that in the romance industry, you didn't need an agent. You pitch them by sending in three chapters and a synopsis. And I thought, great, it's not going to take that much time. You know, I, I have this story idea. I'll put down what I think are three chapters, sent them in. And lo and behold, weeks and weeks later, I get this, this letter saying, you know, great, send the rest of the book. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, there was no rest of the book. <laughs> and so I what I told them, which is, is fictional, was I said, I'm going to Europe for six weeks for business, which was the hugest lie. What I did for six weeks was lock myself after work into a back room and finish the book. But I didn't want them to think that I had taken this so lightly that I didn't actually have a book ready to go. So it all worked out really well and, and they bought it. I still to this day don't know why because I got so many edits on my you know editorial letter. It's like they could have written it themselves by the time I finished the edits. So it was, it was very exciting, it was very fun. So you started out writing romance. How did that did. transition into writing thrillers? Um, well, I uh, kept killing people before they got in bed and I got fired from romance. It was, it was a nice firing. My editor just said, I really don't think this is your genre. And I think Janet, you, you actually, you know, sort of are joined at the hip with me on this one. I, it's not that I don't love a good romantic story. I do. I just don't write one very well. And I have the utmost respect for romance writers um, I was a longtime member of Romance Writers of America, even when I started writing thrillers. And I just think their discipline is incredible, how they can be so disciplined to write multiple books a year and still be as creative as they are is exceptional. Mm -hmm. I just was not in my writing, and it took me a while to figure this out. Um, I think because I did start on a dare, did start as a lark, I hadn't really thought out the process of perhaps making this into my career. And so I was just writing what I felt like writing. And what happened was while I was doing that, I found a voice that felt more comfortable, um, which was in the thriller genre. Mm -hmm. So I realized I really don't like happy endings. I, I really, you know, don't like a linear storyline. I kind of like to be all over the place with subplots. And so I wasn't fitting into the romance genre. And it took me a long time to figure that out. But once I did, it was just like, oh, it was such an epiphany. And then I started thinking I could do this for a living because I really love what I'm doing now. And, and it was nice. I'm envious of people who know that from the beginning. Do you feel that your marketing background helped you with your writing? Yeah, I do actually. Um, well, in, in weird ways, if, if you're talking about actual writing, I think my business background helped me to be incredibly disciplined. So even to this day, and I've been now writing full time, I've been writing 35 years, I've been writing full time about 25 years. Um, but I approach it even today as if I'm going to work. So I am not a pajamas writer. I am not um, someone who says, oh, wow, I can just, you know, I'll work when I feel like it. If I don't work as if this is a profession, I find I am not creative and I am not an effective marketer for my own work. So, so I'm a firm believer in getting up, putting on your makeup, you know, dress in real clothes, no fuzzy slippers. And uh, I also get out of the house. I don't stay in the house to write. If I do that, I'll cook. I'd rather clean the bathrooms, per, you know, really, <laughs> rather than, than sitting down in my home to type. So when I go out to this little coffee shop I've been going to for 20 years, not only do I realize I'm at a workplace, but it also has this sort of ambient quality where I'm, I'm, registering the people who are coming in. I am registering moods and hearing conversations. And I may not be eavesdropping, but I am getting that wonderful sense of life around me. Mm -hmm. And it informs my writing a lot, I think. You know, we, write, we approach this as a business as well, as much as we enjoy writing, but we write between six and eight every morning. Uh, the only thing that interferes is a temperature of over 200. 
<laughs> but we, wherever we are, we travel quite a bit, but between six and eight, every morning we write. Okay, so if Will does not show up one day, I know that his temperature is 201. Yeah, if he doesn't show up to write, he's really sick. <laughs> oh, my. Because, and I think that's the best way to approach it. And yes, I love writing, but you ha I have to do it as if I was working because I worked so many years. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and I do think there's so many professionals who come from lots of different professions, mm -hmm. um, lawyers, doctors, you know, anyone, teachers. And we come to this a little bit later in life, I think. Um, and that brings with us a lot of disciplines that, say, if I was 22, I would not have had. And I appreciate that, that the fact that I can look at this and take incredible joy in the writing process and then take that hat off and move over to now I'm marketing, you know, now I'm, now I'm my own um, accountant and, and all those things. Because what a writer is, is really a small business if mm -hmm. you intend to make your living at it. That's what we are. We just don't have a counter, you know, and mm -hmm. we don't sell things over that counter. But, but we are um, responsible for so very much. And if you don't take joy in it, it's going to show in your writing, I, I think. Yeah, you have to, have to enjoy what you're doing, no matter what you do. I'm impressed, though, that you can only write, be a dedicated writer for two hours in the morning. Yeah. I have to, I have at least four to five, and I've got to really, really pay attention. I must be as slow a writer as I am a reader, because you guys are really... Uh, well, we picked that time in the morning. You know what I mean. Yeah, but we picked that time of morning because nobody's at the office yet. Nobody's calling us. The phone's not ringing. So. Yeah. Plus, you yeah. know, it's, you know, it, it makes sense. And when I was working, I would come home and write from 6 to 10. You know, uh, uh, this was before, you know, the, the baby and all that. Yeah. Um, and that you, you adjust. You do adjust. Yeah. And then when I started working, writing full time, that transition was very tough for me because my my whole being had been wrapped up in corporate work for so long i i was at a loss and so how do i write in the morning now and how do i make you know make my day um as productive as it should be and that was a shock to my little corporate soul yeah it was very very hard but now now i am cooking i'm telling you it only took 25 30 years <laughs> No, again, what we write when, before life begins. That's yeah, that makes sense. And I, I used to have a friend who got up at 5.30. I tried that once, went right back to bed at 5.35. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just called discipline, and I, and it, I agree with you. It comes with age. Yeah. Now, you write legal thrillers and procedurals, uh -huh. but you're not a lawyer or a cop. No, I'm not. I'm not. In my next life, I will be, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but as of now, no. However, I do sleep with a judge. And that's really helpful in my research. Because you know what? You can just get a lot out of him in his dreams. <laughs> no. But uh, he's, he's very helpful in terms of um, clarifying certain aspects of the law that because I always want to make my stories as feasible as possible. I don't, I like creative license. I don't like too much of it. So um, I also though, take it upon myself. I read the legal journals. I am truly a legal voyeur. I love anything having to do with the justice system. So I court watch um, a lot. I, I go down to court. I sit in on trials, both civil and criminal. Um, I attend, uh, sometimes I attend the legal conferences. Um, I've actually been a speaker at the legal conferences, which shows you that most lawyers want to become writers. Most writers want to be lawyers. Uh, but the most exciting thing I've been doing lately is I've been a participant in what they call citizens colleges mm. with the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, um, with the ATF, which is alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and now they have bombs also. Uh, these are eight week intensive courses where I learned, for instance, I, I got a giant box of something and it was the fragments of a bomb and I had to 
try to figure out, you know, what was the trigger mechanism. And it, it's fascinating things. Anyone can do this. But I think for a writer, it's particularly interesting. So I do that. Um, I, I, I just try, if, try to find any experience that's going to make the writing more exciting because I can now write about it because I've been there. You know, I've held that gun or I have looked at the bomb fragments or I have, you know, gone out on a ride along. So I really want to do that. But ever since I can remember, I've read true crime, you know, stuff like that. So I think it, it, it just kind of, inborn I think I know they say you should write what you know but I also think you should write what you love and I love the idea of one person one cop one lawyer one defendant against you know a huge system mm -hmm. I I think that would be terrifying I will never commit a crime by the way <laughs> never because it, I, I don't want to go up against the system at all. So I'm mean, no, all so good. The judge knows you really well. Yeah. That's the wonderful thing about belonging to writers organizations like Sisters in Crime or um, Mystery yes. Writers of America and Romance Writers is they offer so many resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about um, <clears throat> going on ride-alongs and all that. Janet and I even took a, a lock picking class yeah, awesome. We're going to write about it. We should learn. So we went up to somewhere in East LA. East LA, <laughs> and we learned how. I learned how to uh, crack safes too. He's not very good at it. Okay, that's fair. Picking <laughs> of course, you got the touch. You got the touch. I know. There's some. You know, there's some girl stuff crime, and there's some guy stuff crime. So yeah, it's nice you do have worked that out. But they but both break in. That is really cool. The lock pick class. Wow. Well, if you ever need to get into chambers, I have an end. So don't worry <laughs> okay, about it. let me go. <laughs> now, now your, your, your first uh, uh, mystery series, I would have to call it crime series, oh, the Witness series. Right. You've got over 3 million downloads. I know. Isn't that amazing? That. that is, I, I tell you, I think um, there were a couple of things that happened with that series. It was so strange. It was meant to be one book, one standalone book and Pe Penguin Putnam purchased, um, purchased it. But the editor who purchased it said, let's make it three. And so I'm like, okay, I've never done a mm -hmm. series before. I have no idea what I'm doing. But when you're offered that kind of contract, you're, to, of course I can do that. <laughs> And so I wrote the three books, but meanwhile, the editor who loved the series left and went to another house, and I was orphaned to an editor who did not love the series. And so those three books were it. And um, you know what? I got the rights back and all that, that good stuff, and I thought, okay, yeah, I've been doing this a lot of years. Maybe I'm just going to kind of power down on the whole book stuff. And then my husband said, have you ever heard of Kindle? And I never had. So I looked into it. I said, wow, I've got the rights back to all these books. And I put the Witness series, the first three books up first. And uh, a gentleman in New Zealand, mystery writer, he kept bugging me. He get, there were boards we were talking on. And he kept saying, make that first book free. And I'm like, I'm not going to give away my books. This is crazy. No, no, no. Make it free. And finally, he sent me a message, all caps, make that book free. So I did. And, and I made Hostile Witness free. And it's still free today because I think it's a great way to introduce myself to people to see if they like what I write. But that first day, day, there were 80,000 downloads Whoa. Of, of that book. And then there were equal numbers of downloads of the next two. And Steve and I would look at the numbers and finally he says to me, do you think they're gonna make us give back the money? And I'm like, I don't know. We were, it, it was the early days of Kindle. Discoverability was high, um, which it really isn't these days. But that made such a difference, you know, in that that free book introduced people to a cast of characters that had some sort of magic to it. There's now eight books in the series. If I could recreate that magic every day, it would be amazing. Yeah. But there's something about 
that cast that continues to, you know, gain readers and inspire readers. And, and I just, I, I'm stunned, delighted, but stunned. So um, they've become my family, these, these four main characters. And, um, and the series is unusual because it's not um, an episodic series. It's like dominoes. So each book explores another main character's challenge and they have become more physical over time. Um, not quite an action adventure, but definitely physical, um, sort of moving a little more out of the courtroom, but always with a legal premise at their core. So I, I love that series. Are you still writing it? Um, you know what? I thought I wasn't book seven and then came book eight because people keep saying what happens next. And so I am not going to say never say never. I, I'm switching back and forth between the Finn O'Brien series, which is Cops, um, and, and the Witness series. And I think the Witness series kind of needs to go on because there are just, there are always new readers coming in and all, and I get such great letters saying, you know, will there be another one? It's just, I think when, when I do too many at one time, you know, one right after another, after another, I, I'm kind of losing their voices a little. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing for me to put another book in between and uh, keep, keep those voices fresh. Yeah. When we ended the Skylar Drake murder mystery series, we were on a plane to write five books, four oh. books, four books. And people just kept writing one. Go, well, what's happening next? I mean, yes. we thought we were done with it. So we wrote the fifth book under duress. <laughs> we to do we that. were planning on doing and that. And we were planning on another series. We had it all outlined, ready to go. So to we went ahead and did book five, and it became very popular. Well, you know, that's the funny thing, too. I did book eight, and it was a struggle because I kind of felt like I have to do this because I'm kind of tired of getting, not tired, but... I get these letters and, and I wanted to tell people, it's not that easy. You, do you know what I mean? It's, oh, yeah. it's not that easy to come up with this new book within moments. It, it just is a very hard process. You want the end product to look easy. You want to make sure that your reader is like, wow, this is a great tale. And you don't want them to see the blood, you know, <laughs> on the pages. Yeah. But I, I think I was really terrified of that book eight, and I don't know how you felt about your book five, but it, it was such a, a weird love-hate relationship. And then about halfway through, I thought, this is a good story. And there, you know, the voices are there again, so it's okay. It's not stilted. And I guess sometimes you just have to charge in mm -hmm. and, and hope that you recognize when it's, not coming together or when it is coming together. And so I went back and redid the first portion, but that's that last part of the book. I realized there, it was valid. And, and the funny thing is the readers were right. The readers were correct. Yeah. When we did that first, first, that fifth book, the, uh, it took longer to get that together than any of the other Skylar Drakes. But yeah. once we got, it together it clicked it, the whole book just fell apart uh, fell together you know it's like it, <laughs> it wrote itself but there yeah. is a rhythm there there is a rhythm to this and and you can argue should i stop and go do something else and then come back or you know what should you do and i guess my problem is i have a number i have standalone books that i adore that i'd love to make into series got this new series I've got the the witness series that I will always adore um so there's only so much time and I don't know about you but the older I get the less well I don't know if it's that I'm older or I know more now mm -hmm. but, but I'm not as quick in my writing as I used to be and it could just be that I know what it takes to really craft a good book now and it takes time a little does. more self-analytical, yeah. maybe. Much more. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, we closed the door on the first series. You did? Reluctantly to move okay. on to something new. But we both kind of, we think we suffered depression because it was like leaving a town where you've lived for quite a while. Five years. Yeah. 
Oh I, yeah. And also the other thing is, you know, that it works, you know, when you start a new series or you start a new book, you may think, wow, this is such a great idea. And then the reception is not what you had hoped. You know, like the, one of the hardest things is to, to see a review and say, I love this book, but I really love the Witness series. And it's like, but I put my heart and soul into this book. And, and I appreciate it. I know what they're saying, mm -hmm. but it, yeah, I agree with you. There is, there is a sort of deflation you know, when you move on to something new. But I would imagine, I mean, have you really closed that door after book five? Do you think? I've decided always to leave mine cracked a little bit on the Witness series. Oh, there's always that possibility there's somewhere. There's always a possibility of a sixth book, but we're so much involved with this new series. But again, it was the, the depression. It took us almost a year to get back writing something else because we, I mean, once we gave it to the editor, we came home. We were depressed for several weeks until we got. I don't believe that. We got it back, and it looked like she bled all over it. Well, part of why we changed was uh, our first Skylar Drake series all took place in the fifties, and right. our new series moves up ten years to the sixties, and it's a different approach and it's more thriller than it was. Detective mystery. Yeah, yeah. Wow, you're moving into the 60s? I remember the 60s. Well, so do I wouldn't go back there. <laughs> the this is early 60s. Early 1960s. Oh, 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 oh. And okay, that's early 60s is fine. So I did have a pair of white boots I really loved. You know, I would go back for those white boots. I still have my suede hat. I wear it at Halloween, and that's all I could do. It for. Well, I can still wear the same socks I wore in high school. <laughs> Very proud of you. I'm glad you stayed in shape. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I don't even own anything I owned in high school at all. It's too depressing. Like I said, my swing hat is still in existence. <laughs> and well, next, time, next time we do this, I will expect your suede hat. <laughs> okay, I will. I'll wear it. Okay. We have a few more moments. So tell us a little bit about intimate relations, about the Finn O'Brien series. Oh, okay. So, so the Finn O'Brien series is, um, this is... It, the hero, Finn O'Brien, is, is actually inspired by my brother-in-law, who came to this country from Croatia. I should have made him Croatian, but I was afraid my brother-in-law would get upset with me. But he came to this country when he was 17, and, you know, now he's in his 50s. And it's interesting, it was interesting to me how, even after all this time, he has one foot still in the old country, and their cultural values and, and one foot solidly here in the United States. And so I thought this would be a really interesting um, character who is responsible for upholding the law because, you know, what law do you uphold? There is that sort of ancient law from the countries you come from, um, which I always find fascinating to look into these laws of countries that are so old. And then there is this new, ever-changing American, you know, street justice and court justice and all these things. So Finn O'Brien is this, this combination of old country and new country. And his partner is a, a big hair, big blonde haired Texan lady who I adore, Corey Anderson. And what I did was I chose to put them while the Witness series goes out through the world, you know, like, and, and to other states, Alaska, Albania, Hawaii, um, there's uh, Philippines. This one looks way deep into Los Angeles, into the micro areas of Los Angeles. So uh, foreign relations is Little Ethiopia. Secret relations is Richland Farms, which is the only farm area left in all of the sprawl of Los Angeles. These are these teeny tiny little spots that people might drive by and never notice and and i just find it really fascinating what can go in on there for instance little ethiopia um is just a half a block of ethiopian restaurants mm -hmm. and yet there's a center there uh for for immigrants and they talk about the problems with Eritrea and, and the brutality of the 
of the wars there. And I thought, wow, here's this whole group of people that have their own crimes that they are fleeing from. And yet here they are in America. So it's, I, I find this really fascinating. It's a little more gruesome. It's definitely more hard edged than the witness series, mm -hmm. but, um, but I kind of like challenging myself in that direction. You know, how, what, where is that line? And I think I, I never crossed the line between gratuitousness, you know, in terms of violence or relationships. But I do want to acknowledge that LA is not just this huge sprawl. It's, it's real people with real strange, different attitudes and points of view that they bring to this city that we don't notice as much because we're not you know, an upward city. We're an outward city. In Chicago, you know where all the different areas are, the Irish, the this, the that. In LA, it's not as noticeable. So so I, I'm on, now on book four, and book four is Intimate Relations. It'll come out next year, early next year. And it takes place in the brewery downtown, which is actually East LA. Um, it's the largest artist colony in the world. My son used to live there. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I don't even know if I should say what it's about. It's so strange. Um, but uh, he used to live there. He's a writer and there were artists and everything. And, and there was one particular art studio that was really fascinating. And what they did was made high-end sex dolls. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Well, well thank that's you, another Rebecca. whole program. That's another. That, yeah. Well, you know what? I haven't quite exactly worked out the whole thing, but so far so good. It's, it's moving right along. We'll see. Thank you, Rebecca. We appreciate you coming on. And I, I'm looking forward to your new series. Yes. Thank you so much. And yours too. I, this is very exciting for both of us. Thank good. you. And I'd like your, all our, our viewers to know that We'll have the website, your your website at, at the finish of this. So Thank we'll get together and have to talk again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. I'm getting I'm getting to really love this Zoom thing. <laughs> Thank you. Mwah. See you later. Thank you, Becca. <laughs> Thank you for watching. We will see you next time on Chatting with Authors. Be sure to push the subscribe button at the bottom of the screen. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.